So, uh, first of all, um, I don't, for people who don't know who I am, I'm Mark, I'm the owner of uh, Oyster Diving. And I recently got talking to Lloyd, who you can see, well, he's in the corner of my screen, I'm not sure he appears on your um, And there seems to be a lot of common ground with things that we'd like to do to, with things that they are doing. Um, so it's not just about dolphins, it's lots of other things as well. Um, and they kindly, well, Lloyd kindly introduced me to Theo and Theo's kindly um, putting on a presentation on the things that they're doing and possible ways that us as scuba divers can help out as well. So um, if any friends and families aren't watching tonight because they can't make it, then I've just hit record. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to watch it at their <laughs> leisure. So I'm going to hand you over to Thea. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Thea. I'm the project lead at the Sussex Dolphin Project. Um, I shall start sharing my screen um, and I've got a bit of a presentation on who we are, some of the things that we're doing um, and a bit of information about the marine mammals that we have in Sussex as well. So let me... Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So yeah, as I said, uh, I'm Thea. Um, so Sussex Dolphin Project is made up of all local people. Um, we're a fully volunteer organisation um, based in and around Sussex with our, our head office is, at, uh, is in Shoreham at the moment. Um, so there's a few of us and we basically, we all just share a passion for um, local Sussex life and everything in it really. So the background to Sussex Dolphin Project. Um, we were launched in 2018 um, as a project of the World Cetacean Alliance. Uh, they're a big global partnership um, of marine organisations um, specialising in marine mammals, so whales, dolphins, porpoises, um, and a few other organisations as well. Um, they're partners uh, in over 40 countries, so they're a, they're a big global um, organisation. <clears throat> but they realised that they didn't actually have a project on their doorstep. So we were launched um, as a way to connect Sussex people back to their, their nature, um, back to the ocean and all the amazing wildlife that they have off their coast. Um, we also help to support sustainable practices. We do um, a lot of work with other organisations on um, restoration. Um, regeneration of ecosystems. I'll chat to you a little bit about that later on some of the work we're doing um, and preserving livelihoods, working with sustainable fishermen um, and other local sustainable uh, organisations such as kelp farming and stuff like that. Um, so basically our ethos is that we're, we're committed to the conservation of marine species through community engagement, education and research um, because we feel that without community engagement and without local people actually being really interested in, um, in their local environment um, and in what they have off their coast, uh, no work actually really gets done. So why Sussex? Um, Sussex coastline is one of the most poorly studied cetacean habitats in England. Um, so the term cetacean means whales, dolphins and porpoises. It's a collective name for them. Um, so everyone just assumed that there was nothing here. It's a shallow piece of water, quite a narrow stretch with some really heavy traffic. Um, there's heavy fishing, um, high recreational boat use, commercial uh, shipping. So everyone just kind of assumed there wasn't much here. But actually, when talking to people from the local community um, and reading historical documents, there's actually so much evidence um, that that's not the case. We actually have quite a lot of uh, cetacean activity off the Sussex coast. Um, so we decided to actually do something about it and start using citizen science to actually study the populations that we have so that we can learn more about them. So I've checked in a few slides about cetaceans. Um, a little introduction into the biology and ecology, um, just because this is my background. Um, I came into it from the research side of things. So a little bit about what they are, basically. So evolution, uh, unlike most organisms, unlike most mammals, um, dolphins and cetaceans actually evolved um, out of the water onto land and then back to the water again. Uh, their ancestor is a Pachycetus, which you can see at the bottom. 
Um, so it was a little almost like shrew kind of thing that, um, that was around uh, many millions of years ago. Um, and slowly and slowly it develops into a more aquatic lifestyle. So it's feeding more in the water um, and they evolved back into uh, aquatic mammals. Um, but they actually retained a lot of the mammalian features. Um, and this is one of the reasons that they've actually become some of the top predators uh, in our oceans. So some of the adaptations, which are super cool about cetaceans, um, is they have their, so their blowhole is their nose, they're mammals, they breathe air, um, same as you and me. Um, and as ancestors spent more time in the water, um, their nostrils actually migrated to the top of their head, allowing the animals to stay submerged, so they didn't have to come out of the water to take a breath. Um, and they also have what's called a melon at the front of their head, and you can't eat it, it's not fruity kind. Um, the melon is actually um, used to uh, direct sounds that are made by what are called the phonic lips, um, which are located in the airways of the dolphin. So they use this to make that, that typical clicking sound, um, which is echolocation. Um, so the sound goes out, bounces off whatever um, obstacle is in their way or bounces off their surroundings um, and they receive the echo of that through their lower jaw um, and into their inner ear. So that basically means that they can navigate in even the darkest, murkiest waters um, and it makes them uh, really good for things like ri the river dolphins. Um, so they can navigate in the waters even when it's absolutely full of sediment and it allows them to hunt really easily. Um, and blubber. Um, so as warm-blooded mammals, um, this is a really great adaptation because it means that they're really fast. Um, they don't have to, uh, they don't have to warm up, that you know, they have a constant, um, they can regulate their own internal temperature. So the blubber allows them to do that. And you'll actually find the further towards the poles you get, the bigger the animals get. Um, for example, the bottlenose dolphins in the Murray Firth in Scotland, which is some of the most northerly, um, they're actually the largest bottlenose dolphins in the world. And that's purely because they've got this layer of blubber, which allows them to regulate their own body temperature um, and stay warm blooded. So the ecology, um, as I said, they're some of the top predators in the ocean um, and their diets do vary considerably, um, even between different pods of the same species. So our Sussex cetaceans are all fish eaters. Um, but still, we don't actually know that much about exactly what fish species they eat because there is a, not a lot of data on these dolphins. Um, from the data from the dolphins from the Bay of Biscay, which is the closest data that we've got, um, they feed mostly on gadoid fish species such as cod, whiting, pollock, um, but they, they really like feeding on fast moving shoaling fish. Um, as well as squid, crustaceans, um, and, and some flatfish as well. Um, this is just based on the movements of, of the dolphins and their potential prey species. Oh, okay, done that one twice. So, uh, Sussex dolphins. We have uh, three species of dolphin and a porpoise in our waters. Um, and I'll talk you through a little bit about um, what makes what each. So bottlenose dolphins are the most common species that we have in Sussex. Um, they have a large gray body with a pale gray to pink underbelly um, and a sickle shaped dorsal fin. So that means that the dorsal fin curves backwards um, to a point, as you can see in the dolphin on the bottom. Um, they're quite large dolphins. Um, they can get up to nearly four meters long as an adult male. Um, and they're really sociable. They're quite commonly seen in groups of two to 15 individuals. Um, our usual around Sussex is about 10, um, but we have seen much larger groups um, and single dolphins aren't that uncommon. As I said, really playful and curious um, and they will really often come up um, and we get loads of videos of them bow and weight riding, um, jumping in and out of the waves created by the boats um, and using the pressure wave on the front of the boat to actually travel faster. Um, and as far as we can tell, they just do it to play and for the sheer enjoyment of it. The next common we have is the common dolphin um, or the short beak Atlantic dolphin. Um, they have a really characteristic figure of eight shape on their flanks. So um, the front bit is always kind of a tawny brown to a yellow and then fading into a, a pale gray on the, on the back. You can see it really nicely in these 
uh, these dolphins in the picture. Um, and they have a much darker back than the bottlenose. It looks more black as it comes out of the water. Um, and they also have that sickle shaped dorsal fin as well. They're a bit smaller. They can get up to about two and a half meters long. Um, and they're a lot sleeker um, and a bit more slender than the bottlenose. You can also see their faces. So the bottlenose has a really distinctive bottle shaped nose um, on its face, hence the name. Whereas the, the Atlantic dolphin or the common dolphins, um, they have a lot more slender beak, um, which is one of their distinguishing features. I've got a little video, I think, next of some just off Portsmouth. I'm going to play the audio for this one because I love it. Don't worry. You can see um, really clearly on here the, the patterns on their sides, um, which is really cool. It's a really, really nice video, of the clear water. So you can see um, there's a few slightly smaller ones. That one that just surfaced is a, is a juvenile. So you can tell they're obviously a lot smaller than the adults and they normally stick quite close to the side of one adult as well. But one of my favorite things about getting videos in like this is hearing people's voices just hearing the joy when they see the dolphins, it absolutely never gets old, even when I'm only the one sat behind a computer screen watching the video, um, knowing that um, the dolphins have actually brought that little bit of joy um, and made someone's day so much better is, is amazing. So the third species of dolphin that we have are the white beak dolphins. Um, these are really like solid, chunky dolphins. I say they look a bit more like bodybuilders. Um, they have distinctive pale grey and white flashes along their flanks and a grey saddle patch, um, which is the patch just behind their dorsal fin. Um, they have a much taller dark black dorsal fin um, than our other dolphins, and they quite often actually get mistaken for orca. Um, so yeah, they're, they're a lot beefier than our, than our current dolphin, than our bottlenose and our common Atlantics. Um, and they actually have a really short beak, you can see in the picture on the bottom. Um, which is either a white or a pale grey, but they don't have that long, that long face like the bottlenose um, or the common Atlantic. Um, again, they're quite chunky. They can get up to three metres in length um, and they're really fast swimmers underwater. They're not normally um, as, they don't do as much aerobics, I call it. They don't do as much leaping out of the air as the others, um, but they're really, really fast. And again, they're often seen bow riding, um, but they're more of an offshore species. So they're less commonly seen inshore and they're more seen uh, about 10 miles out and further. So we normally get reports of those from people that are doing like cross channel sailing and stuff like that. And my personal favorite is the harbour porpoise. These are the smallest and the shyest cetaceans that we have in Sussex. Um, they only get up to about two meters max. Um, so yeah, they're really tiny <laughs> um, and they're really cute. And the reason that I love them is because whenever we get a sighting, we know that it's actually a lot um, more of a privilege than any of the other dolphins. Um, the other dolphins will love, they'll come up from, to the boats and they'll play, but the harbour porpoises are really shy and they actually tend to avoid um, the presence of boats. So if you're out on a boat and, and you do see harbour porpoises, um, you're really privileged. We know they're here because of acoustic data um, and also sadly because we do get strandings um, and, but that is a good way to, to have a look at numbers. Um, so yeah, they're most often seen in groups of two to five individuals um, and quite often spotted alone. They're not as sociable as, um, as the larger dolphins. Um, they, they surface more, um, so dolphins come up and they do like a, a slow or fast, like shallow arc in the water, but dolphins come up a little bit more. Um, it's like they're doing a circle. So they, that's one really distinctive feature is how they surface. Um, and as you can see in that photo, they have a, a small triangular shaped dorsal fin rather than that long um, falcate dorsal fin or a sickle shaped dorsal fin um, that the dolphins have. So onto our seals. You guys all, if you're out and about on the waters, you'll probably have seen some of our seals. Um, we have two species and this was a little harbour seal. 
that was actually spotted only a few hundred meters from our office. So our office is just behind those buildings that you can see um, on the shore there. So that's really cool to know that they're, they're here. Um, and this little one was quite curious um, and surprised these swimmers while they were out for a morning swim, I think. Oh, yeah, so as I said, that was a, a harbour seal or common seal. They confusingly have two names. Um, and the one in this picture is actually a, a pup that's actually molting. So that's why it's got that silver colour to it. Um, they're quite commonly seen off Sussex coast. We have two colonies. We have um, a larger, col a mixed colony, so um, at Chichester. And then we also have a smaller little group of four or five um, at Eastbourne Marina, uh, Sovereign Harbour. So yeah, there's a few of them along the coast and um, they're quite often seen hauled out, um, having a nice sunbathe on the, on the mud flats and on the shingle beaches. Um, so their most distinguishing feature is the face. Um, and the coloration. So harbour seals are quite small. Um, they only get up to about two metres in length. Um, they are kind of a, a sandy grey um, colour with small speckles on them. They also have a really cute, I call it like a cat-like face. Um, so it's a short nose, short flat nose um, with V-shaped nostrils. So that's quite a good way of, of defining them. Um, and we'll skip on to grey seals so you can see the comparison. Um, these are the grey seals, these are the other seal species that we have in Sussex. So they have a few distinguishing features from harbour seals. They have much more of a, a dog-like nose. So they have a very straight face um, when they're in profile. Um, and they're a lot more solid, their neck is a lot more straight. So it looks like their head goes straight into their body. Um, whereas harbour seals have a little bit more of a round face and then you can see the shoulders coming out as well. Um, their colour, as their name suggests, is grey, um, light to dark grey, um, and they tend to have quite large patches. Um, as you can see on the one in the, in the photograph, they have uh, bigger splodges on them. And these are actually really useful um, for identifying them. So grey seals are actually quite easy to, to ID if you can get photographs of them, either with their head out of the water like this, um, side on, or lying, lying on a beach because we can, they, all their markings are, are fairly individual. They're a bit like fingerprints. Actually map up um, and individuals around the coast and see where they're moving. Um, yeah, these are also found in the mixed colony in Chichester. Um, but there's also a few loners that pop up um, all along the coast. So there's a few that come up along Eastbourne, Pevensey Bay, um, and there's a few young ones in Bexhill as well. So they're really nice to see. Uh, oh yeah, this is on Pevensey. This is a a male and a female. So these are the these are grey seals. You can see they've got that really straight face, um, straight nose. The females are playing it quite nicely here, um, and uh, and you can see they're really quite chunky, um, chunky individuals, and not the most graceful when they're they're out on land. They're definitely more in their element when they're in the water. So as I was saying, citizen science um, is how we collect all the data on our marine mammals. Um, and this is really where, where you guys come in. So we, we work directly with local communities to ensure that the marine wildlife is documented, protected and valued across the Sussex coast because having value um, to the local ecosystem is so important when you're working on protecting specific mammals. So our public sightings database um, is super important and um, this is my realm um, so if you do happen to see any marine mammals at all when you know, if if you're not surveying in particular if you're just out and it's an opportunistic sighting that's fine that's perfect um, we do have a contact form on the website um, and report it by social media I can send you anyone that wants to know um, a little bit more information about what we need um, but we need the species number, location, landmark if you don't have coordinates, um, juveniles, uh, behaviour, time and date, and photos and videos are so vital um, in order to be able to conduct our, our, our science um, and actually have a, have a chance of tracking, uh, tracking these animals. 
So effort-based based data collection is where we're really looking for local organisations to get involved, um, specifically with the marine mammals, this part. Um, so effort-based data collection is basically um, presence absence data. So at the moment with the opportunistic sightings, we only have presence data, which is fine, which is brilliant. Um, but the effort-based data is really key because we don't not only know, need to know when the animals are there, we also need to know when they're not there um, so that we can actually have a really good map of where they are um, and what they're doing and what areas are really important for them. Um, so effort is the amount of time spent. So this can either be, I mean, because you're, you're divers, I'm assuming. So this can either be in the boat on the way to or from dive locations and while you're diving. Um, and the, the track is the route taken to the survey. So we'd need to know, um, need to know the track so that we know exactly where you went um, and where dolphins were or weren't. Um, so each survey needs to be logged, even if you don't see any dolphins, um, because that's, that's, again, that's really important to know um, where, where they aren't as well as where they are. Um, you can either dedicate a number of dives or trips a month to research, doesn't have to be every dive, um, as long as you've logged um, the ones that you're surveying on, or you can log every trip um, and send us the data of, of every trip that you do. Um, and then we will we'll know, we'll have a, a much clearer idea um, of, of when the dolphins are around. So ecotourism is a big thing that we, we get involved with. So ooh, we, ha we have a few trips that run every year. Um, and we charter a boat and go out along Brighton seafront. Um, so they usually run May to September. Um, and this is much more of an educational experience than it is for collecting uh, research data. Um, although we do sometimes get dolphins that close to the coast, um, it's, it's not very common. So this is much more used as an educational tool. Um, it's really great to get people out, families out, um, and actually be able to talk to them while we're in the dolphins habitat about um, what we have um, and, and how to report them um, and how people can get involved as well. So conservation education is, um, is a really, really key part of our work. So you can't have dolphins without having um, a good environment for them to live in. <clears throat> and that's so important is having a good habitat because it's not only the dolphins that need protecting, um, it's all everything that they eat and their prey species. So you can't just protect the apex predator, you have to protect the whole food web as well. So cup conservation is also where we're hoping that you guys can come in as divers as well. So we're hoping to work with the Help Our Kelp project. Um, and we've actually are hoping that we've just got some funding in to work with um, Sussex University um, to get a master's student in to actually do some, some proper work on active restoration techniques. Um, so I don't know how many of you have heard of the Help Our Kelp project um, or know about the, the bylaw that, that recently got passed um, off the Sussex coast. So I'll give a little bit of a, a background. Um, so there used to be kelp beds, huge kelp beds spanning from Selsey down to Shoreham and then smaller kelp beds all along the coast. Um, and kelp beds that create a really great three-dimensional habitat, a little bit like a, a forest on land. Um, they provide coastal protection, so they reduce storm damage, um, they reduce, wa reduce wave action, um, they can change the sediment type by catching silt, um, they in can increase water quality, the benefits of kelp beds just go on and on and on. Um, so it was degraded initially during massive storms in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, and then unfortunately, fishermen realized that there was this whole great new area that they could fish in that they hadn't been able to before. Um, and this just degraded the habitat further and further and further. So we now only have one or two small patches of kelp um, or significant kelp patches um, that are actually of any use. So there's been a bylaw put in, um, supported by the Help Our Kelp Project with Sussex IFCA um, and the Sussex Wildlife Trust. Um, and they've actually managed to succeed in getting 304 square kilometers um, of the Sussex coastline protected from, uh, from trawling, which is really great because this means that it gives the, the habitat some breathing space to recover. 
um, and it um, the, the kelp beds to support all the other commercially important fish species um, that the fishermen are, are actually fishing. So it will actually work out better for them in the long run, um, as all the juveniles that grow up in the kelp beds um, migrate offshore. So our key aims are to research and conserve the marine mammal species off the Sussex coast. Um, but as top predators, they need a decent supply of prey. And that's what we're really hoping that restoring the kelp beds um, will help to do. So the link between restoring kelp beds and dolphins is really straightforward, as I mentioned, prey availability. Um, the, the kelp beds support a lot of the gadoid fish species um, as nursery grounds and also breeding areas. So a lot of the fish that the dolphins feed on um, actually spawn um, and grow up in the kelp beds. So the work that we're doing with Sussex University um, and Shore and Port as well is they've allocated us um, a small patch within the port to trial restoration um, of local key marine habitats beginning with the kelp. Um, so basically we'll be studying how, how we can grow kelp um, to support in active restoration um, so that we can look at cultivating kelp in this small area and then transplanting it um, either as, as tiny seedling form or as larger plants um, out into the local environment. Um, to be able to support the active restoration going on um, with the help our kelp. So what we really need um, from anyone that's diving is locations and footage of kelp um, that, we, that you see on your dives within Sussex, particularly within um, four kilometres of the shore between Selsey and Shoreham, um, and within one kilometre of the shore from Shoreham down to Rye. So if you're out diving and you see a patch of um, large brown algae, um, that's most likely kelp. Um, so please send in any footage that you have um, along with precise location data. Um, it's so important to be able to map what's there um, and what's growing as well, because the Help Our Kelp campaign needs loads of support um, so that in a year or two, when people turn around and be like, okay, this band's been in for a while now, what's happened? Um, they can either look at their data or they can come to us and we can show them that we've had this kelp that's been reported growing here and here and here and here so that we can actually show people what benefit um, the, the trawling ban is having. Um, so we've also done a lot of media work. Um, this is just a, a little shout out to Lloyd because Lloyd is, um, has worked really hard on all of this. So the inshore trawling ban um, was actually backed by Sir David Attenborough. Um, so yeah, trawling um, is quite a destructive fishing practice um, and it's, uh, it only gains so much press because um, of some really uh, great communication projects that have been going on with the Help Our Kelp campaign. Um, sorry, I've mixed up my slides. <laughs> um, education. Yeah, so um, obviously the next generation is so important um, to conservation. Um, we have a, a really great education volunteer who goes around to all the schools um, and also we're looking at setting up some more adult education sessions, um, a little bit like this, um, but hopefully not with me messing up my slides, um, to educate people on, uh, on what we have, how they can protect it and how they can get involved. Um, so this is volunteering. Uh, we have some really great sponsors, um, which are these guys. Um, and they, they sponsor us financially, um, but a really great way for, for organisations like yours to support us is by supporting us with research, um, because we need as many eyes and ears out on the sea um, as we can possibly get. Um, and if anyone fancies swapping their energy supplier, um, we've recently set up a fundraiser uh, with Octopus Energy. Um, they're supporting the terrestrial restoration work that we're doing with Shore and Port, um, working on coastal rejuvenation um, of the area. So Octopus Energy are a fully renewable energy company um, that have set up with us um, and they do some really great work and support some really great causes, including us. So there's a link on our Facebook if anyone wants to um, wants to switch energy supplier, um, you get £50 off your account and they donate £50 to us. So, <laughs> uh, 
um, and more ways to volunteer um, is by becoming a wildlife guide um, and, and collecting data and just going out and getting out on the water. So we do have a sustainability event coming up, um, which is Shoreham Sustainability Week um, on the 9th and 10th of September. Um, there'll be loads of organisations there um, with showcasing what they're doing, um, showcasing what we're doing at the port. Um, so if you want to pop down and have a look at what we've been spending our time doing, um, please feel free. Um, it'll be really nice to meet some of you and have a chat. And I shall stop talking now. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Thea. That was amazing. Um, what's, re what's really nice about that presentation, you quite often see and read things about things like that in like the Bahamas and places like that. But the fact it's actually happening off our own coastline or the whole conservation thing, as well as having dolphins and things as well, is fantastic. Um, for, for those who aren't that familiar with us, we do um, some shore dives down in shore and very close to the harbour entrance that you just showed on your, on your image there. And we also do boat dives out of Shoreham as well. So we're going to start tagging on the data collection that you want with those. If anyone wants to come on those boat trips. So, for example, we've got one on the 29th of May is the next one. And um, we've just put on a, an, under our dive club under the UK trips. We've got wide water dives. And um, we also do the boat dives for uh, non-experienced dive as well. We'll go to like a little wreck called the Indiana. And then also we do some deeper dives for more experienced divers as well. So we'll be able to go to a different range of places to help collect some data for you as well. So um, that's, that's us trying to do our little bit to help you as well. But um, hopefully we can make this grow as well because I've, I've got a feeling you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, but it's probably going to take, I don't know, five to ten years, I would imagine, for the kelp beds to grow back into any decent quantities is it or? yeah it's a it's a long-term effort um and that's that's one reason why we're really keen on investigating these active restoration techniques um because what we're concerned about is that it's actually shifted states so there's what's called a, a stable state um and kelp beds are one stable state and now it's switched back to more of a soft sediment state um so it's going to take a while for um for the kelp beds to actually um, gain a foothold again um, so yeah hopefully the active restoration will create oases um, of, of kelp that can then spore into the water um, and and yeah so by the time speed she, up the process by, a little by the time bit she's my age she'll be able to see lots of nice little animals and dive through the kelp forest then by the time she's your age she can go swimming 21. through the kelp forest <laughs> and <21. yeah. laughs> Cool stuff. Um, so yeah, should we open up to some questions? I don't know if anyone else has got any questions for you. Um, don't be shy. <laughs> I mean, I guess if people do have questions or if they suddenly want to do a follow up with you, that they can they can get hold of you through your website and Facebook page is probably the easiest way, is it? Yeah, website, Facebook. Um, just pop us an email. Um, it's info at sussexdolphinproject.org. Um, that will come straight to our admin team who'll forward it to me or Lloyd. Um, so yeah, do get in touch. I mean, um, we have some, hopefully we'll have some really great volunteering opportunities coming up with COVID restrictions being um, relaxed. So yeah, if you want to get involved with other volunteering, um, we have uh, things like beach cleans, litter picks of our, our rewilding area in shore and port coming up. Um, so yeah, just pop us an email. And, and we'll get you involved. Fantastic. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like we've got any more questions, so I'm going to press stop on the recording.